Um, I hope everyone uh, have viewed the lecture from last week and um, understands uh, the stuff that was contained in it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, essentially that example and we'll talk about a few things. Uh, people uh, in general have been doing a great job in this course. Um, any errors that people have been making have generally been rather small. And I just want to sort of um, go over some things, some of the common mistakes um, that I've found, and just sort of remind you of a few things. And then we'll get into the new material for this week. So we have these two pages, finished and tutorial. And finished contains this stuff. And there's a link to tutorial. That contains an image. All right. So let's look at the code for finished and the code for tutorial to, to, to review a few things from last week. First of all, in finished. There are some tags that you should have on every single page, and they should be set up exactly in this way. All right. You're going to have a doc type on every page. You're going to have an HTML on every page. And corresponding to that, you're going to have an end HTML on every page. And then everything is going to be nested between the beginning and ending. Um, HTML tag. There's only one of these per page. And one nice thing about Visual Studio Code is I can click on this to sort of collapse and expand that section. That sometimes can help me find if my uh, tags are not nested properly. At any rate, I'm going to have a starting and ending HTML tag. I'm going to have a head and a body tag. Everything is going to be either in the head or the body. All right. The head tag contains information about the page. The body contains the actual content of the page. So far, the only thing that we found that belongs in the head is the title. And every page should have a title as well. All right. As far as the body goes, let's talk about that. We'll talk about that in a second here. You could, in other words, save a file that looks like this somewhere out on your, on your disk and use this as a template for every single page that you create. Because it has the tags that are going to be on every page. It has the doc type, it has the HTML and ending HTML, it has the start and end head tag, and it has the body tag. Now, those are every single page. Now, most of the pages you, you're going to have are going to have the following. They're going to have a header. And I know this is confusing, and I didn't make the rules, so don't blame me. I'm just here trying to explain the rules. The header actually belongs as part of the body. A common mistake I've seen a lot of people make is to put the header either part of the head or between the head and body. The header belongs as part of the body. In fact, all of these tags, the header, the nav, the article, section, the aside, and the footer belong as part of the body. I've seen a number of students put the body after, I'm sorry, put the footer after the body. I can understand why you do that, but that's not correct. The footer belongs as part of the body. So all those tags that sort of define the basic structure of the page, header, nav, section, article, aside, footer, I think that's all of them. All of those occur inside the body and they must be properly nested. Usually the top of your page is gonna look like this. You're gonna have a header, that is sort of like a banner that explains what the site is about. Then you're going to have a nav. 
And that nav is going to contain the links on the page to take you to different places. And again, those links can either be internal links or they can be external links. That is a link to another page or another site. And this example contains examples of both. Please review that if you have any questions. You're then going to have the different sections of the page, which can be in an article or it can be in a section. And finally, at the bottom, you're going to have the footer. Each article will probably have head, uh, head, headline tags, H1s, H2s, paragraphs, and so on. So that's sort of the basic structure of the page. And if we look at all the pages I'm going to do in class, or virtually all of them, are going to have this basic structure. One of the other things that I may not have mentioned explicitly, but I am going to say this now, is that your IDs and class, well, we haven't talked about classes yet, so kind of ignore that. But the IDs should have no spaces in them. So for example, if I want to make the ID for this web development, don't put a space in it to make it web development. Have it as just web development run together or when web dash development or web underscore development or something like that. So there should be no spaces as part of your IDs. And when we cover them, when we start covering classes, which probably will be today, there should be no spaces in your class names as well. All right, so think of this, think of these things as using proper grammar on your web pages. You might say, well, the page communicates what I wanted it to, but if you didn't follow these rules, you're not following the grammar, and that can get you into trouble sometimes. The page might look good on your browser. There could be a problem on another browser, for example. Or there could be problems when search engines try to process your page and try to index your page, and that's important. Any number of difficulties you might have if you don't follow these rules. So even if it doesn't make a visible difference on your page, it's important to follow these rules. Okay, the one tag that we talked about last time, or we, the last time in the recorded lecture, <clears throat> was the image tag. And here's an example of the image tag. The image tag has two attributes to it. Remember, we said an attribute is additional information about the tag. We have an attribute over here when we talk about the link. We have the href attribute. We say, what does the href mean? It means what you're linking to. In this case, we're linking to one of our pages called finished.html. In this case, it's not enough for us to say that we have an image tag. We have to say what that image is. What file contains that image? And in this case, the file is in an image called one.jpg. Now notice there's not like a C colon slash user slash mzeller slash whatever. Don't put that. Don't put the things that start with C colon, the actual uh, um, static um, um, absolute uh, file address. For now, we're going to put everything in one folder. So notice my web page and my image is in the same folder. And if I do that, all I need to do is say one.jpg. Just like if I do that with pages, all I have to do is put the page name. Also associated with an image tag is the alt attribute. 
And this is a very important attribute, even though it's not visible. In other words, we don't see this text, the picture of sunflowers taken in autumn. We don't see that when we view this page. However, where we do see it is if we are accessing this page and we are using uh, some alternative technology, for example, a screen reader. People that are visually impaired sometimes use programs called screen readers to access web pages that actually goes line by line and reads the content to the user. Now, when it comes to an image, the technology is not so sophisticated that it can, it can tell what the image is of, right? So you have to put in sort of a tip to tell the screen reader, hey, this is what that picture is a picture of. Again, it's not as good as actually being able to view the image, but we're talking about for people that are visually impaired. So we put a little brief description of saying what the image is an image of, and that is in the alt attribute. The image tag is the first tag that we've seen that doesn't really have a start and ending tag. I mean, I guess it does. I could do this. I could do this and image. I could also, and don't make a habit of it. I don't think it's a good habit to get into. I could also leave off the end image tag. Or I can do this and put the slash right before the end triangle bracket. That indicates that this tag is a starting and ending tag rolled all into one. So that's the way I usually do things. So image SRC says the says the um, the, the the file that uh, the image contains uh, that contains the image, and alt is a description of the image. And if we do that, we'll get the image appearing on the page. Now this is not a class in uh, multimedia. There is a multimedia class, but it's sometimes good to edit your images. <clears throat> and the good news is these days people are more sophisticated and know about editing images. So you can use really any program that you want to edit your image. Some people have Photoshop. There's a free program called GIMP that allows you to edit images. And <clears throat> for example, this image originally was much bigger. So I made a copy of it and I made the image smaller by resizing it. You can take a big image and make it smaller. If you take a small image and try to make it bigger, you're gonna lose detail and the quality of the image is going to uh, diminish. It's always a good idea to make a copy of an image before you start playing with it because if you decide if you make a mistake or you decide you wanna go back to the original size of the image or whatever, you have that copy because you can never make that image bigger again if your only copy is edited to be smaller. One thing to be careful about is copyright law. Now, this being a, a classroom environment, the copyright law is a little bit different than like, let's say you were opening your own business or even if you were putting up a personal web page actually on the web, not for a school project. Now, in this case, this image uh, of the sunflower is actually an image that I took. Therefore, I own the copyright for it. But usually something like that, the copyright notices are a good thing to put in the footer of the page. Um, I talked about background image. That's not available. That's not visible right now. Uh, I'm going to add that back in in a minute here, and then we'll see what, what that's about. All right. One thing you might notice is this little special character here, little copyright symbol. That is actually accomplished with a ampersand, the word copy, and a semicolon. These are HTML special characters. 
if we Google HTML special characters, we'll see a whole list of our HTML symbols. There's Greek letters if you were doing, I don't know, fraternities or mathematics. Let's start with an ampersand and end with a semicolon. There's a symbol for the euro, symbol for registered trademark, symbol for trademark, arrows, the suits of cards, and so on. So if you ever want to put these things on your page, you can do so as long as you know the special code. And in this case, for copyright, it's ampersand, copy, semicolon. All right. This should mainly be a review of stuff that we covered in the recorded lecture. At least I hope I recorded uh, I covered it in the recorded lecture. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add styling to our web pages. All right. And we're actually going to create a second file or a second kind of file. Let's put it this way. And that file is going to contain what's called CSS or cascading style sheets. We're going to do that in a minute. Right now, I'm going to do, I'm going to put my style on the page this way. In the head section, I'm going to put a style tag. That tells the browser you are now in CSS land. The rules of HTML don't apply in CSS land. The rules of CSS apply. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. It's the language we use to describe the appearance of our page. HTML contains the content, CSS contains the appearance. Now, usually for my first examples, I use color. And uh, I hope even if you're colorblind, you'll be able to see the difference between the colors uh, that I'm using here. But First example we're going to do is a very basic one. What if I wanted the color of the page, the background color of the page, to look different? All right. I could do it like this. Body. Nice thing about Visual Studio Code is it gives you sort of IntelliSense. But I could make the whole web page yellow by typing in body, and then in these curly bracket or braces, I put the word background color, colon, and then yellow. All right. Here's how the style rules work. Each one of these lines is going to be in our cascading style sheet data is a rule. And rules work like this. This is what's called a selector. This tells me what on the page I want to change. In this case, I want to change everything inside the body tag. Well, that's our whole web page, right? Because the body of the web page is in the body tag. In the braces, I describe what it is I want to change about it. And here I'm saying I want to change the background color, background dash color means the background color of the page, colon, and then what I want to change it to. Now there's a whole bunch of color names that are available. If you go out on the web, you can look at color names. Alice Blue, Antique White, Aqua, Aquamarine, whole list of them, including our yellow. So what this is going to do is it's going to make the background of the whole page yellow. So if I save this, and I view this page in the browser, Background of the page is yellow. 
All right, that's about the simplest thing that you can do on a web page is change the background color. Now, some of you might know older ways of doing that, like putting something in the body tag to describe the color of the page. That we're going to avoid. Anything about the appearance of the page we're going to put in our CSS because of what you're going to see in a minute here. How I can take all my CSS and put it in a file and then have multiple pages access that file. Now, I can do something like this. H1, background color. I'm going to make it red. Might not be a pretty page, but it'll demonstrate what I want to do. How does this work? Well, this rule has a selector of H1. That means every H1 on the page. There's an H1 here. There's an H1 here. There's an H1 here. And there's an H1 here. Every H1 on the page, we're going to give the background color of red to. So there we go. The background of the page, the background of the whole page is yellow, but the background of the H1s is red. Why? Because the H1 is more specific than body. Right? The body is general, the whole page. The H1 is just a specific area. And as a general rule, the farther you're in, nested, the precedence is going to take as far as style rules go. I could go and make my H2s white. So now I have a page that has three different style rules. The whole page gets a background of yellow, except for the H1s and the H2s. They get a background of red and white. Now the other thing I can do is I can change the color of the text. That is the color attribute. Let's make the color of the text blue. Notice what I have. I have the name of the attribute colon value semicolon, then the next attribute colon and the value. Sometimes people do this to make it more readable. That way I have the H2s, the background color is set to blue, the color, that is the color of the text is set I mean, the background color is set to white. The color of the text is set to blue. And if you notice, these things have a color of blue. Just these simple things gives us a lot of power on our web page. All right? We can make without too much trouble, really ugly web pages now. We don't choose our colors carefully, all right? I use just the basic primary colors because I really wanted the colors to stand out. And again, I hope that uh, no one's colorblind and I hope everyone can see the colors uh, on this page. But how do you know that your color scheme is good, all right? <clears throat> First of all, you want the color scheme to have contrast. If, for example, I put the text on the H2s, if I made the text yellow, yellow text on a white background isn't going to look good.
going to be very difficult to read. On the screen, it probably doesn't look like there's anything there, but there is text there. It's just in yellow. So the first rule I want to have is I want to make sure that there's a good contrast between the color, between the text and the background. Second thing I want to do is I want to make sure that my color scheme sort of matches the theme of the web page or the website, right? If, for example, I was doing a website for a heavy metal band, all right, you could probably imagine what the background color of the page is going to be, right? What's the background of the page going to be? It's probably going to be black, right? Because if you ever see people with heavy metal band t-shirts, invariably they're, they're, the color of them is black. If, however, I was doing a, a web page for Barbie, all right, I'd probably make the background color pink, right? Because people associate Barbie with the color pink, all right? If I was doing a website for, let's say, a national park, or a, a metro park or something like that. I probably would use earth tones, greens and browns and that sort of thing. I probably wouldn't use bright neon colors and so on on the line. So you wanna use the colors that sort of match the content of your site. All right, that's sort of the second rule. And the third rule, there's actually science involved in picking good colors. All right. Some people just have that knack to be able to define good color schemes. You know, these are the kind of people whose clothes always match and they, you know, everything looks ideal with them. But for the rest of us, there are HTML color wheels, essentially. Back in the old day, web de uh, designers, graphic designers had these little cardboard uh, color wheels that they would dial up and find matching colors. If we do a search here for HTML color picker, one in particular I like to use. Look for palette generator. All right, this is the one that I use. Color scheme is another synonym for that. So I usually use this color scheme. So this allows us to generate colors that match together. Notice they're sort of showing you these colors which match very well together. There are several schemes that we can use. Monochromatic means every color is a version of the one color. So these are all shades of red. Adjacent colors are colors that are next to each other in the color wheel. Triads are across from each other in the color wheel. So are tetrads. And then finally, there's a freestyle where we're not going to follow any rules at all. Let's say, however, that it's fall, right? Or it's getting to be fall here. So we want a fall sort of color scheme. So I'm going to going to pick orange sort of for my color scheme because orange is a good fall color and sort of turn this dot over to orange. You can do that to widen the color scheme.
And let's say I like this color scheme. That's the scheme I want to have. These are scientifically using color theory set to match. The other thing to keep in mind is white and black always can match along with shades of gray. Now, what's the name of this color? What's the name of this color? I don't know, all right? Different people could come up with different names. There's a different way to refer to colors, and that's with a color code. So if I click on this, actually, if I put my mouse over this, There, I can make it a brighter orange by dragging this more towards the outside. So if I look and pick this, notice that the, the, when I put the mouse over, it might be a little hard to see, but there is a color code. In this case, it says FFB162. That is what's called the color code. All right. Now, I can put that in my color tag instead of the color name, but I proceed it with the pound sign. What did I say it was? F1, FF, B162. So if I save that then, My page has that sort of pale orange look to it. Let's make, let's pick other colors from our, our, our thing to, to make the whole page have a nice little design. FF8101. I need to put the pound sign in front of it. I think it's 8101. I think I reversed those. And that's kind of the brighter orange. And let's make the H2s FF9A33. And I'm going to make the color to this black, which is the default. If you don't define something, the browser default takes effect. And in the case of text, the default color for text is black. So I save this and I look at the page. That's what it looks like. Not bad. All right. So we're moving into making our pages look more professional with this and more unique. All right. And to match the colors that that's going to match the theme of our website, whatever we're trying to express. Okay. Now, this is all well and good. We fixed this page to make it have a certain style. What about our second page? Oh, that doesn't have the style because we didn't give it that style yet. Well, we might think, let's do this. Let's copy this over here, paste it in here. All right. And that's going to work. 
So now both my pages match. But what happens if I change this page? That one got changed, but this one didn't. So if I have my style code duplicated between two places, the disadvantage is if I change one, I have to go and change the other. That may still not seem so bad, but what if you have a large site where you literally have hundreds of web pages? Then to go back and make a change in every page, every time you want to change the style on one page is going to be a huge task. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the style code in a separate file. And in this case, I have a file called style.css. And I use slightly different files in this case, or slightly different colors in this case. But let's take a look at what this file does. All right. Let's go and, but, but we have to tell each page, hey, use that file. So I'm going to create a link tag here. Right? And I'm going to put this in both my pages. If I save both these files and look, I did something wrong. My file is called site.css, not style.css. So you got to get the name to match. Now, if we look at it, I have to change it in both places. We get these new colors. Notice we did some other things though too. And we'll look at the CSS code to see how we accomplished them. We actually changed the size of the font for our H1s to make our H1s really big. And we put a background image on our page. And we actually made the background image semi-transparent, so we can sort of see the image behind it, at least in some of the cases. Let's look at the CSS file that we have here. All right, body, background, pound sign, FF, D, A, A, A. And where, where can I find these colors? We can use a color generator like we used before. We can also look up HTML color codes. And 
And you can put the code in here to see what it is. Or rather move around here and see what the color is. Slide this around and it shows you the code. So there's a number of ways that you can find that out, but that's the color code we're using. Then I have URL computer.png, no repeat. What that will do is that will find the image called computer.png and make that the background image. And no repeat means simply that it won't just keep displaying it over and over. It will just display it once. H1, I made the background uh, and the color, and I said font size 4M. M is emphasis. It means four times bigger than normal. My paragraphs, I made background this color. This is simply a different way of doing Doing a color name, so it's an alternative way. In fact, if we look back over here, we'll see the RGB code. It's another way there. So there's three ways that we looked at today that we can express a color. We can have our hex code, we can have the color name, or we can have this RGB. And the extra thing on the end of it is the opacity. In other words, how solid is it is. A value of one means that it's completely dark. A volume of, of uh, zero means that it is uh, not visible at all. It's completely see-through. Or I can use the opacity property. This means it's 70% solid, the navigation. Notice here that with just a little bit of CSS, we've taken our web pages that were all full of content before, and made them look more like professional pages. Now, this is where I encourage you to experiment, because color is just one thing that I can change. I, I change color, but you can change the font size, you can change all sorts of things. You go to the W3, W3 Schools site, and look at the CSS reference, it'll show you all kinds of things. So I sent the font of a page, and it shows you an example here how you can set the font. How you can set the width of a page. Notice everything so far on our page has been covering the whole width of the screen. But we can make the width smaller. That's the default. That's why I changed it to 150 pixels. This is 50% which means that it will change as the page gets bigger or smaller. We'll cover a lot of stuff in class, a lot of different techniques in class, but it's good for you to experiment on your own with different things in CSS to figure out how to do certain things. Now, I have another example here that would behoove you to study, version 2, where I take the same HTML and I make it look different this way. Between these two pages, the HTML didn't change at all. The only thing that changed is the CSS. And if we look at the CSS, still not a lot of code. But I'm setting some different attributes. I'm setting the width. I'm setting the margin. This margin is what gets me centered. 
padding is the space between the border and where the text starts and so far. So take a look at this example as well and play around on your own. Do some, do some uh, investigating online to see how you can change different things on your page. The sky's the limit. Virtually anything you can think about a page, you can figure out how to do, uh, to do it via CSS. What I want to do with the last couple of minutes is to look closer at that hex, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, hex code and the RGB codes. All right, when you talk about color of light, not pigments, not paint, there's different rules for paint than there is light. Um, Colors, all colors can be chosen based on what's called an RGB code. That means how much red, how much blue, and how much green. Now the red in the hex code, if I have a code that looks like this, First two characters always mean how much red is there. The second two mean how much green there is, and the third means how much blue there is. FF is the highest value in hex. Hex is a different numbering system. It's base 15 instead of base 10. So in base 10, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In base 16 or hex, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, then 1, 0. All the way up through. All right, we'll be there in a minute. Thanks. All the way up through FF. Someone's coming here. I, I, I don't have anything to say to them, uh, unless I was next door. At any rate. The values can go from zero to FF. With that being about in the middle, 8A. Eight, eight. So if I were to say CF, that would be relative high amount of a color. If I said 2-2, two, two, that would be a low amount of the color. So if I said something like this, FF eight eight, FF zero zero eight eight. I should have these in the wrong order. It should be red, green, blue. There'll be a lot of red, no green, and a medium amount of blue. That would be a reddish purple. If I switch these around, it would be a bluish purple. If everything is at zero, that's black. If everything's at F, it's white. If the pairs of numbers match, that's a shade of gray. So I have one, two for the red, one, two for the green, one, two for the blue. And that would be a little amount of each. So this would be a very dark gray. If you don't get this, it doesn't matter. As long as you can read these charts. As I move my color line this way or this way, it's showing me the hex code down there. The other kind of code we talked about is an RGB code. And that is simply, you say RBG and then you put the values in and these are regular decimal numbers. So in this case, the RGB for this color would be 38 comma 201 comma 201. And with RGB, you have the, uh, uh, there's also closely related to it is RGBA, 
where you can also put the, uh, the what's called the alpha value or the opacity. I could lecture about this for ages and I wouldn't cover all the properties and all the ways you can do things. That's why my suggestion is for you to play with it and have fun with that. Try to make your pages look personal. Try to make your pages match the mood of whatever content that you're trying to express on, on your page. And play around with it. Go to the W3 school site, look at my examples. Go to other websites online that show CSS, look in the book. And use that to come up with something that looks really unique. And it actually can be fun, believe it or not, playing around with these things and getting them look exactly the way that you want them to. All right, that's all I had for today. Um, if there are no questions, um, that's it. Uh, I will be in my WebEx room uh, in a couple minutes here if anyone has any questions. Uh, and if anyone's going to lab, I'll be in the room as well. So talk to you guys later.